Welcome to the next in the Cadigo Symptom-Based Complications and Dialysis webinar series. Today's episode is episode four, Advancing Symptomatic Care in Dialysis. Please submit your questions and complete this episode's questionnaire via Slido at slido forward slash advancing. Today's speakers are Edwina Brown, MD, Imperial College Renal and Transplant Center in the UK, and Mark Vervloot, Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Now I'll turn things over to Dr. Brown. Go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm Edwina Brown, and I would like to thank the organizers for asking me to give this talk about changing the focus of dialysis care to symptom control. So this is my um, list of disclosures. I always like showing this um, fresco um, from the medieval hospital in, uh, well, not really medieval, 15th century hospital in Siena. Uh, and it's a series of frescoes, um, and it's called Care and Government of the Sick. Um, and what you can see here in the front is the healthcare person looking after the patient or the person that they're looking after. You can see the man tenderly washing the feet of the individual. And on the far left, you can see somebody um, tenderly putting somebody um, in, in bed. And that is our responsibility as um, physicians, as healthcare professionals, is caring for that individual in front of us and really ignoring um, the guideline people behind, often who come up with sort of rather artificial targets that have little to do with the way the person that we're looking after. So what I'm going to be talking about is why the current interest in symptom management, thinking about how one can implement the focus on symptom management, what's the evidence and embedding symptom focus into routine practice, what is the patient impact of, the, um, of all of this, what are the challenges to changing the focus of care to symptom management, and what research is needed. And all of this really started with the first of the KDIGO controversies conferences, um, which took place uh, three to four years ago um, in Madrid. And this was really thinking about dialysis initiation and modality choice. And it was at that conference that the uh, term goal-directed dialysis really emerged. And this was published uh, in Kidney International in 2019. And as you can see in this diagram, the actually most of the things that impact on somebody's well-being who is on dialysis is actually not impacted by the dialysis itself. So on the left hand side, you can see all the blue things which are, um, are impacted by dialysis, but by far and away, the majority of factors um, are on the green side, and those are not directly affected by dialysis treatment or dialysis unit care. And that means however much we ramp up the dialysis to achieve some sort of biochemical target, we are not actually going to be affecting the well-being of the person we are looking after. At the same time um, as the controversies conference, and um, while that paper was yet to be published, um, the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis was updating uh, its own guidelines or recommendations for how you prescribe peritoneal dialysis. And this was published in Peritoneal Dialysis International last year. And the main recommendation that came out of this was again, um, PD prescribing was, should be goal directed was that peritoneal dialysis should be prescribed using shared decision-making between the person doing PD, their caregivers and the care team to achieve realistic care goals, to maximize quality of life, satisfaction of the ind individual, minimize their symptoms 
and provide high quality care. Again, no biochemical targets. So how do we implement this um, focus on symptom management? What's the evidence and how do we embed it into routine practice? I'll come to evidence from renal medicine first, around later, but I'm going to concentrate on oncology to start off with, because there have been some randomized controlled trials in um, oncology, and this is probably one of the bigger um, and more recent ones, which was done at the Sloan Kettering Institute in New York. And they looked at symptom monitoring over six months of chemotherapy uh, and measured uh, quality of life using the EQ5D. And what you can see in the bar graphs, um, blue is, is um, good quality of life, that uh, in people who are getting the um, intervention, in other words, the symptom um, monitoring and, and therefore treatment of symptoms had a better quality of life, um, both in terms of the total score on the left and a change by more than six points, which is the clinically important um, difference on the right. And the um, graph on the right shows that those who had symptom control were less likely to visit the emergency room. So it has had also had an impact on healthcare usage. So this sort of study has led to a flurry of publications. And fortunately for me preparing this lecture, a lot of these publications um, have come out this year. And this one um, in a journal called Journal of Patient Reported Outcomes, um, it was looking at how should patient reported outcome measures be used in healthcare systems. And really the, to keep in mind is that there are three ways that PROMs can be used. Um, firstly, at the patient clinician level to inform patient management and care plans so you can actually identify specific symptoms, monitor how people's outcomes um, uh, vary over time, and then use that to inform treatment decisions. And that by doing this, this empowers patients to feel that the um, healthcare team is taking notice of how they feel um, and therefore they interact um, more freely um, with um, their care providers. But PROMs can also be used um, at the healthcare organization level to inform um, them about uh, how patients' health outcomes are varying at a group level, evaluating performance of an organization in comparison to others, um, and examine effectiveness of healthcare interventions. And again, it can be used at a higher level, uh, so you, you can compare different um, groups of patients. You can identify, for example, people um, of one social strata or um, one ethnicity or places, people who live in towns compared to cities. Um, and you, you can look at how PROMs are performing, and therefore that would inform resource planning and allocations. But to be able to do all of that, there needs to be evidence that um, obtaining um, and measuring patient reported outcomes actually has an impact on um, patient outcomes and on healthcare provision. And there's been a recent Cochrane review, which was published earlier this year, um, and they um, have weeded down the literature to 116 randomized controlled trials across a whole range of different disciplines, um, psychiatry, primary care, oncology. And the first thing to note is that all these studies were done in uh, high income countries, North America, Europe, and Australasia. And the certainty of evidence varied between very low and moderate. So there is moderate certainty that PROMS feedback probably improves quality of life and leads to an increase in patient physician communication, diagnosis and notation and disease control. 
but there seems to be little or no difference for general health perception, social functioning or pain control, and there's uncertainty about any effect of PROMS feedback on physical and mental functioning, as well as fatigue. And fatigue, of course, is a really crucial symptom um, for people um, with kidney disease. And, but really importantly, no studies have shown any adverse effects of distress to individuals who have to um, fill in PROMS um, questionnaires. So what about using PROMS in kidney failure? So Fred Finkelstein uh, wrote an excellent article in um, C. Jason a few years ago. Um, as many people know, he's been a proponent of the use and development of PROMS um, for many years. And he, he highlighted that really uh, the cornerstone of patient care should be symptom management and meeting patients' needs. And that gets back to that fresco that I showed you from the 15th century hospital in Siena. And that uh, using artificial targets such as KTO would be compromises uh, that cornerstone because then focus of care changes to changing dialysis, delivery, burden of dialysis, et cetera. And that may actually even make free people feel worse. But there are major limitations in the problems that are currently used. How often should you measure them? Uh, it's, it's an individual experience. So patients' experiences are going to depend on numerous factors, uh, such as have they had a row with their wife that morning or husband? Um, have they just had a big bill to pay? Have they just lost their job? Is there a lot of stress at work? Have they just been on holiday? All of those things are going to impact on how people perceive their quality of life and their symptom control. So how often should we be measuring them? Um, just once a year won't really give any idea about how somebody um, is feeling. Uh, if you measure too frequently, then maybe people will lose interest and stop filling in um, the questionnaires. Um, and of course, there's the challenge that the management of many of the symptoms, such as pain and depression, are very complex, complex um, and really beyond the resources of a dialysis unit. What we've learned from other specialties is that one may well need electronic testing rather than pen and paper um, to be able to facilitate uh, completion of the questionnaires and not only just the completion, but also the reporting to clinicians, um, et cetera. So in this paper, um, he recommended that um, to be able to implement PROMS into routine patient care, that really PROMS should be mandated, um, but that the mode and frequency of administration of the instruments should be at the discretion of the facility, that we need to encourage innovative approaches to the integration of PROMS into routine care, and we need to explore the use of smartphones, uh, um, tablets, etc., and that we also need to think about how all these, this information is going to be documented and then used. So moving on to people who are actually now using PROMS in routine care, or at least um, in, in a quality improvement or research uh, milieu. So this is the um, Canadian experience, uh, predominantly in Alberta, Alberta, but also in some centers in Ontario, um, and they have been doing a study called the Empathy Study. So this is a multi-center cluster randomized controlled trial to evaluate routinely um, reporting PROMS in hemodialysis care. So first of all, the PROMS were given to adult patients who were willing and able to complete questionnaires uh, and people with cognitive impairment, which of course is very common in people with kidney disease or having acute dialysis were excluded. In some centers, the PROMS were translated into the top three languages. Um, otherwise you had to use interpreters. 
the PROMS used were some sort of um, pain questionnaire plus uh, EQ5D to measure quality of life. Um, and within this study, the PROMS were measured every two months, but in centers outside the trial, um, the frequency varied. Uh, and there were two ways that people collected the PROMS, either electronically, and this of course required investment in IT support, or on paper and the nurses entered the data manually into the records, which is very laborious. They then developed a PROMS report card um, and the clinician used that um, to guide symptom management. And this is just what the report card looked like. So this is one um, in, in a center that goes back to 2017. So the green ticks um, are where the pain control score, they were using the Edmonton symptom score was um, zero. The exclamation mark is where the yellow one, where the mild symptoms and the red one where there's um, moderate to severe symptoms. And first of all, you can see the variability, but also you can see the number of symptoms um, that people have. And, and this is going to be a challenge um, in terms of patient management. There's really no results yet um, from the empathy study, um, apart from this one, which has just been published uh, looking at the burden of mental health symptoms. And I think this is probably um, going to be the prelude to how many of, um, of, of the outcomes of this study. So first of all, they found that the burden of depressive and anxiety symptoms was similar to published data from research studies. But really crucial is that uh, while patients and nurses um, realized that the PROM use actually revealed mental health concerns, there was huge uncertainty whether it is within the scope of dialysis care um, to actually deal with these symptoms, um, particularly with the lack of mental health support um, within dialysis units. So what is the patient impact of, of the um, changing the symptom to focus, um, focus of care? And what are the challenges of doing this? So um, recently, um, there have been publications from both the Netherlands um, and from Sweden uh, about embedding um, symptom surveys into routine dialysis care. And uh, the Mark's talk after mine is going to be giving details of the Dutch experience. But the um, issue of Clinical Kidney Journal, where this was published, also had an editorial written by Sabine van der Veer, um, uh, Cecil Couchou and Rachel Morton. And this looks at the role of kidney registries in, in enabling large scale collection of patient reported outcomes. So uh, visually, um, this is the, uh, the big circle is, is the um, registry. Uh, on the left, you can see um, the arrows that go, go to um, actual patients. So you get the PROMs being reported and feeding into the registry. Um, and then um, data is fed out to the clinicians um, in terms of um, shared decision-making to um, enable management of the symptoms and quality of life, and also um, directly to the patient uh, so that they can do some self-management. Um, on the right, you can see how collecting all this data um, could improve audit and service improvement, commissioning and policy-making, um, and research. So by using the existing infrastructure of national kidney registries would enable longitudinal and sustainable PROMS collections um, across um, different service providers and patient groups, and that this data could then be made available for individual patient care. So looking at real life experience, um, I've divided it into various domains. So let's think about collecting the PROMS data. There's general agreement that this needs to be repeated, um, that it's uh, electronic really um, collection is needed for repeated measures and that paper collection is, is not um, really viable. 
Um, but somehow we need to uh, avoid excluding people who don't have access to digital technology. Um, so you know, infrastructure is going to be needed, for example, tablets to be used during dialysis sessions, and you need to train patients and staff um, on PROMS interpretation and subsequent actions. And that's certainly um, the experience from the quality improvement work um, that's been done in the UK um, and led by Rachel Gare. Look, the next question is, is how many patients actually um, fill in these questionnaires? In research studies, and this is certainly my experience because I've used these questionnaires in research studies, it's usually about 70% of people uh, who agree to enter a quality of life study um, and then you can um, collect the data. However, on repeated measures, that number goes down and uh, all the data from longitudinal attempts to collect quality um, of life data from um, patients on dialysis shows that there's quite a significant attrition rate over time. The Swedish and Dutch um, experience with electronic collection showed that really only 30 to 40% of people uh, were able to uh, fill in the questionnaires and did this regularly. And again, we'll hear more about that in the next talk. In terms of clinicians, they need to be trained as to how to interpret and, and uh, the data from PROMS and they need to be motivated um, to be able to do so because this does change the structure of the way um, we interact with patients. So what research is needed? Clearly a lot. And the key is setting up an implementation team and that's really got to include healthcare providers, patients, families, PROMS experts, IT support, um, and they should be involved in both the any quality improvement, audit and research. You then got to think about what is your target population? Is it everybody on dialysis? Is it specific age groups? Um, what about language barriers, um, etc.? And we need research on how you're going to complete the questionnaires. We then need to think about which questionnaires. Uh, and as um, Fred Finkelstein has pointed out, um, both in the article in CJSON, but also in the um, ISPD uh, guideline for prescribing, uh, we don't have really good questionnaires for the dialysis population. Um, and we need to think about which ones to use. Um, do we need new ones to capture factors that are more common in people on dialysis, such as fatigue? We also need to think about workflows so if we are going to be collecting all this data, we need to um, work out what's the best clinical pathways within renal units and how's that going to link with external health and social care providers. Because it's not just renal clinicians who are going to be uh, providing the resources to um, help people um, with quality of life issues. So this is going to require a lot of education and training. And again, we need to think about what are the best ways of doing this. And then we need to pilot um, how, how to collect and use PROMS data um, reporting and feedback. So a lot of work. But is this the right approach? So this is um, William Osler, um, who was professor of medicine at Oxford and really one of the founders of clinical medicine as we know it today. Um, and this is one of his quotes, listen to your patient. He is telling you the diagnosis. Do we actually need such a laborious process of working out how our patients feel, what is their well-being, and what are their main symptoms? Is this something that we can change in the way that we interact with people in the clinical situation? And certainly in my own um, peritoneal dialysis clinic, I very rarely talk about biochemistry and I am always asking people about how are they, what are they doing, what are their main symptoms? And then asking them about specific symptoms such as fatigue and appetite, itching, so ones that are directly affected um, by dialysis. 
And I'm going to finish off with this painting. That I'd like to thank um, Fred Finkelstein for um, introducing me to this painting, which is in the Yale Art Gallery. It's by Edward Hopper, and it's called Rooms by the Sea. And on the left is our comfort zone, uh, with the way that we're used to working. And the blue outside is this new wonderful era of where we're going to be focusing on how um, people on dialysis actually feel, what are their symptoms and personalizing um, their management. Well, we've got a big empty space that we have to go through first to be able to reach our goal. Um, thank you very much for listening and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you, Dr. Brown. As a reminder, please submit your questions and complete this episode's questionnaire via Slido at Slido forward slash advancing. Now I'll turn things over to Mark Flavut. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Edwina, for your wonderful presentation. Um, and I noticed there is only a slight overlap of what I am about to say. And the title of my contribution is as you can see on the screen right now, how to implement screening for symptoms. I will cover a bit more uh, and I hope to, well, to pave the way to implementation of screening. And this may be in a way as Edwina, Edwina mentioned the Osler way, but we might actually need something more and which I will discuss. So my name is Mark Verflutz. I'm a professor of nephrology in Amsterdam. And I'm very delighted that Kate Deco organized uh, these webinars on a topic which is close at my heart. And I will tell you why in a minute. Here are my disclosures. And none of these, I guess, are related to the topic I'm discussing with you today. I am involved in Kate Deco. Um, and the outline of my talk uh, is this. And this slide will come back in the end. And then you can judge if I managed to discuss all of this. And the first thing I want to point your attention to that the dialysis population is changing. And this change in characteristic of the population might require a change in attitudes towards care and towards treatment. I have one slide uh, which depict, is depicting a potential roadmap to symptom-based dialysis care. As announced by Edwina, I will give you one example from screening for PROMS in my country. And I will also, unfortunately, well, not so much unfortunately, but I will point to implement, uh, barriers to implementation. And we need to identify these barriers in order to implement. Sorry. And in nephrology, we can learn lessons from outside nephrology, which mainly will be oncology. And the final part of my uh, presentation will be uh, based for uh, capturing the area around the potential change in the curriculum for nephrology trainees and fellows. So the first thing uh, I want to bring to the spotlight is the fact that the, po uh, the population on dialysis actually is changing. And as I said, this might require a change of treatment and a change of care. And two key characteristics that may have changed over time is the aging of the population on dialysis. And the second one is that there might be more, more comorbidity. And I will show you in a minute that this actually is the case. And these change characteristics might dictate that we need to change the focus of care and supportive care. But the population on dialysis is uh, changing in more directions. Sorry. Uh, there's increased diversity and we face more language barriers, which is a hurdle for us if we want to implement shared decision making on symptom based dialysis care. This slide is amplifying the change in aging over time and what you see on the left hand graph is the overall numbers of patients on central hemodialysis in my countries from 2005 to last year. And you can see that there has been an increase in the total numbers on central hemodialysis dialysis up until 2013. And the number by which this increase is about 1,000. 
On the right hand side, you see on the graph, all patients over the age of 65 in my country over the same period of time. And you can nicely see that the increase in total numbers of patients on dialysis is completely attributed to these elderly patients. So this is demonstrating that indeed the average patient is aging. I already mentioned to you that there also is an increase in comorbidity, and th these are data from the US RDS, so the US data in uh, six eras, ranging from 1995 to 2012. And I want to draw your attention to the three examples of comorbidity, <coughs> which are underlined in red. And the upper red line indicates the proportion of patients who have a body mass index above 23, so above the mean of this population, which was almost 63% in the mid-90s and increased to over 80% in the most recent uh, era, which was captured in this uh, publication from 2017. The same holds true for hypertension as either a comorbid condition or as the actual cause of end-stage kidney disease which was 77 in the mid nineties and increased to almost 90% uh, in the most recent data. And the same applies to diabetes, which increased from uh, 55, or sorry, 54% in the mid nineties to over 60% more most recently. And the most striking difference is that in the mid nineties, there were only 11.4% of patients that atherosclerotic heart disease or coronary vascular disease or peripheral vascular disease, which was 11.4% in the early days and increased to 23% in the most recent da data. So this is a doubling of patients with these severe comorbid conditions, which most likely will impact on their mortality risk so the question arises if we should indeed move beyond focusing on mortality as in the key endpoint in patients on dialysis. And on this slide, you see examples which tell we might indeed need to move beyond mortality as an endpoint. On the left hand side, you see a meta analysis of the use of statins to modify and improve cardiovascular risk. And in the red circles, you see the effects of statin treatment for patients on dialysis. And the boxes above these red circles indicate the effect of statins on patients not yet or not on dialysis. And going from up to the lower endpoints, you see cardiovascular mortality, uh, beneficial in patients with CKD, but not on dialysis, but no effect for those on dialysis. The same applies for major cardiovascular events, no effects for patients on dialysis, fatal or non-fatal myocardial infarction, no effect for patients on dialysis, while it is effective if you have CKD. And finally, a trend for worse outcome for patients uh, for the endpoint of fatal and non-fatal stroke for patients on dialysis. So what about blood pressure? Something we focus on a lot on our patients, <coughs> my apologies. The figure on the right is the association between systolic blood pressure measured prior to hemodialysis and the hazard ratio for all cause mortality. And it's quite striking and actually a bit disappointing to see that any blood pressure above 140 has no impact at all on mortality risk. While we pay so much attention in controlling hypertension, but if these, well, these are observational data, but this, if this is true, then targeting hypertension, systolic hypertension for patients on dialysis is pointless. The only thing this figure tells us is that we must be very careful and prudent with patients who have low systolic blood pressure prior to hemodialysis. But again, exemplifying that is, uh, targets of treatment in pre-dialysis and in patients without kidney disease may not apply for those who are on dialysis. 
And I guess you all know the examples that many trials that focused on so-called hard clinical endpoints, uh, primary endpoints in patients on dialysis have been extremely disappointing. So we have trials that aim to normalize hemoglobin. The trial was negative, and actually there was a signal that attaining normal hemoglobin, hemoglobin levels for these patients is uh, dismal, actually. Aiming for higher KT over V. A negative trial changes in dialysis modality. Some trials suggest there is a benefit. The largest trials says it doesn't. Cynical said targeting hyperparathyroidism, which in observational study is associated with increased mortality, but the evolved trial was negative on its primary endpoint. Vitamin D trials, blood pressure studies in patients on dialysis, which I already mentioned, phosphate binder therapies, and so on and so forth, all negative on these so-called hard clinical endpoints. This might be a reason to change the perspective that for many of these patients, we should not target so much on quantity of life indicated on the left hand side, and maybe a bit more on quality of life. And I depicted the spectrum of quantity versus quality of life with these bright colors in the middle. And actually, during these webinars, you will hear many people say, including me, that the goal should be based on shared decision in which many factors should play a role, one of which is life expectancy, individual wishes, and attainable targets. And these targets might differ a bit depending on the goals that has been defined in the shared decision making discussion with the patients. So, if the focus would be on quantity of life, the targets might be dialysis dose. Uh, first of all, aiming for kidney transplantation, obviously, uh, trying to achieve optimal lab values, blood pressure, and so on and so forth. But if the shared decision making and life expect expectancy dictate that we should focus a bit more on quality of life, then the role of symptoms should be increasing and we should focus on pain, sleep, anxiety, and many more aspects which will I which I will address in a minute. And focusing on these symptoms is something many physicians uh, might not do sufficiently, including me. And this is a report from uh, well, 14 years ago already, in which it was studied to which extent uh, providers were aware of the prevalence of patient reported outcomes. And in this list, you see that 68% of patients report feeling tired or have a lack of energy, and only 45% of physicians were aware of this uh, symptom, and 25% were unaware. Well, this might be not so much of a striking difference, but if we go down this list, it's a bit more embarrassing to see that we as physicians are hardly aware of the presence of dry skin, dry mouth, itching, and sleep disturbances in these patients. So apparently nephrologists and our patients, we have very different agendas. And you probably recognize, like I recognize the list on the left-hand side. So when we do our rounds, well, I'm happy to hear that some nephrologists change this habit. But for many of us, when we do our rounds, we focus on KT over V, hemoglobin control, iron control, blood pressure, volume status, excess patency, which of course is necessary, and phosphate control. And while we are talking to our patients about these endpoints, the patients might be thinking about fatigue, cramps, feeling isolated and being independent or not being dependent having pain and being sleepy because of insomnia, being depressed and being uh, anxiety in, in excitement. And we hardly, unfortunately, talk sufficiently about itch, if you have may heard in one of the previous presentations. So how to improve from where we are right now? So potential roadmap. Well, first of all, to become aware of symptoms, we should screen for them and we can do so by just asking and 
discussing in empathetic way to our patients, or we could try to formalize the screening by using questionnaires and polls. We will discuss a bit about that. And the focus of the conversation with our patients or these questionnaires should be on symptoms and quality of life. Then once we are aware of the results of the screening, we should identify for whom we should move from calls of treatment, by which I mean the so-called hard clinical or biochemical endpoints to calls of care. And we should report back and discuss with our patients, analyze these data. And once this is done, we should, in a discussion with our patients, make decisions on treatment goals or treat goals of care. But the next step, obviously, as already mentioned by Adina, would be how to implement the treatment and caring plan. And obviously, we should evaluate the effect of this because we need to improve the well being of our patients. So, acting on what we find by screening should lead to improved care. And finally, as I mentioned, as my last bullet in the agenda for my lecture or presentation, is that we need to teach young nephrologists about the importance of symptom-based dialysis care, and not only dialysis care, actually. And finally, a key question which is in need of additional research is, is if symptom-based treatment actually improves symptoms and quality of life. And I will talk about a few barriers in the second part of my presentation. Um, I will shortly discuss what is currently ongoing in my country, and this was studied by Esme van der Willek in the Clinical Kidney Journal uh, earlier this year. Uh, and she discusses the routine measurements of symptom burden and health-related quality of life in patients on dialysis. The implementation for this observational study was that patients were asked prior to an out of ward visit to fill the SF12, which is health related quality of life questionnaire, and a 30 point dialysis symptom index. And these two measurement tools were selected after scrutinous evaluation of potential tools to do so. Patients were asked to uh, provide these data at baseline and then after three and six months subsequently. These data were all filled electronically and captured in the Dutch nat National Registry, uh, which is termed uh, Renine. And the findings are discussed with both patients and their spouses. And it was also benchmarked by the national uh, average results for patients on dialysis. And these questionnaires were available in the three sorry, in the four prevailing languages in my country, which are Dutch, obviously, English, Turkish, and Arab. Now, I'll give you three examples of these questions. Many of you probably will know if you are aware of the SF12. So question number one, in general, uh, how would you say your health is? And this is a five-point scale coming, going from excellent to poor. Uh, question number two, um, how does your health now limit you in these activities? If so, how much? Moderate activities such as moving a table, pushing a vacuum cleaner, bowling, or playing golf. Three point answers, and the same for climbing several flights of, of stairs. And the third example, the last example I give you here is uh, question number six How much of time during the past four weeks did you feel calm and peaceful? Five point answer, did you have a lot of energy? And if you felt downhearted and blue? And the examples I gave you here are all, as I mentioned, from the SF12. Uh, and in addition, there is an active uh, inquiry about uh, specific symptoms from the DSI, there is a symptom index. And I don't provide examples of that one. So what were the results of this study? In total, 1588 patients were uh, included in the studies and 1415 were actually asked to participate, uh, which is indicated uh, in the second box on top. From these 1415 patients at baseline, 28% of 
questionnaires were actually returned and captured in the system. As I mentioned, patients were asked to fill in this questionnaire three times. So after three more months, 1,260 patients were asked to repeat this questionnaire. And at that time point, 21% returned these uh, DSIs and SF12 uh, reporting with substantial overlap to the first baseline reporting. And finally, after half a year, almost 1,200 patients were repeatedly asked to send in their polls and questionnaires and 21 responded. And overall, in this study, 35% of 1,415 patients returned at least one of these questionnaires. And actually, this is one of the barriers in implementing uh, this way of screening for symptoms and signs of patient reported outcomes and actually the 35 is quite disappointingly low number but this is interesting because what you see here is a response rate per center and you can see that the differences are tremendous so we have a few outstanding centers centers number three and eleven which reached a response rate uh, of nearly well between 60 and even above 70%, which is outstanding. And we should learn from the centers how they motivated their patients to bring in this data. And as you can see, some centers did not so well of a job. But this benchmarking uh, provides the opportunity to learn from one another. It's not very surprising that responders and non responders are different subgroups. So the responders were more frequently male. And there was not so much of an age difference, but there was a difference in the social economic status. So patients that did respond had on average a higher social economic status compared to the non-responders. And what did these patients actually respond? Well, on the left hand side, you see the list of most frequently reported uh, symptoms on top being feeling tired or la lack of energy, dry skin, trouble staying asleep, muscle cramps, itching, and so on. Besides the frequency with which these symptoms were scored, there was also a scoring of the amount of burden per symptom. And well, actually, I was surprised that patients experience difficulty in becoming sexually aroused to be the top on the burning list, trouble falling asleep, decreased interest in sex, feeling tired and lack of energy being the, the foremost burdensome symptoms reported by the patients. And I think these data are important for nephrologists to be aware of. So what about experience outside of nephrology? And as announced and also shown by Edwina, some and most of this knowledge comes from oncology. And this is a quite recent study, supportive care, published in Supportive Care in Cancer, looking at the impact of the use of PROMS in patients with uh, oncological diseases. As you will notice, Many of the results of studies like this don't provide nice tables and nice figures, and many of the results are actually in text. But I think this text is, in, is of importance, and I will give you some time and I read out the key finding of this study. And this applies to oncology, and we have no reason to assume that this is different in nephrolo nephrological care. So in general, implementing prompts in daily cancer care had a predominantly insignificant or positive effect. There appears to be a trend towards better outcomes, uh, improved health-related quality of, layer, of life, and patient satisfaction and patient-physician communications, which is easy to conceive. Importantly, there was more positive effects when feedback was provided to both the patient and the healthcare prof professional. And therefore, it's highly recommended that feedback is always done. And in summary, this review provides evidence that the use of prompts, especially when combined with this feedback, can improve outcomes and experiences on an individual patient level. So how to move forward? While many questions remain, and I summarized 
some key questions that would, well, which are in need of an answer before implementing a symptom based nephrology and screening for symptoms. So, who will handle all the data coming from PROMS? Who will provide the feedback? And in the Dutch experience, this is usually the, the nephrologist who sends out the invitations to fill in the SF12 and the dialysis symptom index scores. And how to decide which aspects which emerged from this uh, input from the patient to tackle. A key question actually is if these improved symptoms, uh, if this will all improve symptom and quality of life. Many of these findings from PROMS might require specific expertise. So possibly uh, anesthesiologists, if pain is a key symptom, <laughs> Uh, we might need help of uh, psychologists and so on and so forth. But all this additional care will also bear the risk of additional burden of treatment and it will most likely increase workloads. And the question of course is if this additional care is reimbursed. Besides all these hurdles, there are a lot of potential stakeholders involved if we want to implement symptom-based management and I ordered, a, I created a list of potential stakeholders in random order, except for the patients being on top and his or her family, but there might be an important role for the, for the primary care physician, renal nurses, nephrologists, social workers, physical therapists, psychologists, dietitians, pain specialists, dermatologists, for instance, in the setting of itching, Geriatricians, psychiatrists, neurologists, and all these people might play a role in addressing symptoms which emerged we were up until recently unaware of. Fortunately, palliative care and symptom based medicine is gaining attention in nephrology, and this is a very recent publication published in Advances in Chronic Kidney Disease which identified several key aspects of palliative care in nephrology. And we didn't talk too much, and we intentionally didn't talk too much about decisions not to start dialysis at all, which is palliative care, but also in patients that are on dialysis, many aspects as are listed here in these eight boxes require more attention, I would say, as we do right now. So the final part of my presentation is about the curriculum. And the first thing I obviously did was looking at the curriculum in my own center. And I felt ashamed that we didn't even mention patient-based nephrology care for patients who are on dialysis. And the next thing to comfort myself is that I looked into the curriculum of several other important uh, clinics. So I looked at the Mayo Clinic curriculum and I looked at the Johns Hopkins curriculum for nephrology. And fortunately to me, like Amsterdam, there was no mentioning of symptom-based uh, patient care. Two years ago, there was an extensive list of publications in the American Journal of Kidney Diseases, which in total comprised 99 extensive PDA PDFs one of which was about person-centered care in all the patients with kidney disease, core curriculum 2019. And in this one PDF, there were two pages only. Uh, I have to say these were two excellent patient, uh, pages on symptom-based medicine. But I think this is a bit, well, too low uh, given the large burden of symptoms for our patients. So, as Edwina also mentioned, symptom-based nephrology care nowadays is a large terra incognita. It's an area which is unexplored, which in the, in the era of the Romans was termed the Hic Sunt Leonis. It's an unexplored area. And we need to move into this part uh, because it's so important for patients. So I promise I would come back to this potential roadmap to implementing a symptom-based medicine for those on dialysis. So if we adopt this, we should screen, we should identify the individuals for whom we have to move from goals to treatment to goals of care. 
We have to report and discuss the findings of this screening. We have to analyze and based on this, we have to create shared decision uh, in establishing the goals of care with the individual patients. And then we need to implement the treatment and the caring plan, which fits in these goals of care. And obviously we have to repeat the measurements to evaluate the effect of all the efforts we put into this uh, changed caring plan. And finally, in my last slides of this uh, presentation, I would argue that we need to teach nephrology fellows about this neglected part in dialysis care. And finally, a key research question is that we need to tackle, which we need to tackle is if symptom-based treatment actually improves symptoms and quality of life. Thank you so much. And I think we can now proceed to the questions and answer session. Thank you very much. We'll now move to the questions and answer period. Please submit your questions and complete this episode's questionnaire via Slido at Slido forward slash advancing. Okay, so thank you everybody for paying attention to the two presentations. And we now start off with the question and answer session. And I would like to kick off by giving uh, the floor to Edwina. Uh, so Edwina, you already mentioned, uh, and this is one that I want to ask you, if we really need to move from metrics, metrics which were based on laboratory results, now moving to metrics which are based on ways to quantify symptoms. So can you comment on what you said during your presentation? Well, I'm going to be honest that when I started preparing this presentation, I thought that we should be moving over to uh, formally measuring symptoms and quality of life um, in, in, in all our patients. But the more I've read about it, hearing your talk, seeing the data, I, I think that we're developing a very complex system and replacing one um, quantitative system, namely collecting biochemical data which, uh, and uh, hard data such as blood pressures that we have discredited. And we're just going to replace that with another complex system that will probably also be discredited at some point in the future. We already know that its uptake is very low, even in Western countries, um, which have a, a great um, source of funding. So if we think of dialysis expanding in lower income countries, they are never going to be able to implement what is being developed at the moment in places like the Netherlands, Sweden, Canada, um, et cetera. And I'm just wondering whether it, a, a different approach would be focusing on education and thinking about how do we train healthcare professionals to actually focus on patients' well being and symptoms during routine clinical evaluations? Yes, I can understand that. Uh, well, I. To some extent, I do agree. So I do agree that we need to avoid from moving from one system of metrics, which is focused on laboratory results and blood pressure and so on and so forth, from metrics which just quantify symptoms, but the content of this metric would differ, right? Yeah. So the content first would be on laboratory results, for many of which we don't have any idea if attaining so-called targets improves quantity of life. But there will be a substantial difference if we focus more on metrics which are based and um, measuring symptoms. Would you agree? Yes. I mean, at least measuring symptoms and hopefully doing something about the symptoms may improve quality of life, if not quantity of life. But it, we're not even sure about that because if um, we start thinking about pharmacological ways of controlling symptoms. Um, first of all, that's going to increase healthcare costs. And secondly, it may well actually result in drug interactions, drug side effects, um, etc. And then eventually maybe patient disillusionment with the whole system, because if they don't feel any better because of what we're doing, they're not going to fill in the questionnaires. 
And then, <laughs> yeah. then we're back to point zero again. Yeah, this is a bit a disappointing uh, point of uh, well, disappointing point of view, I would say. <laughs> well, so what we, as you know, at Wienet, we have much more ways to uh, try to um, manage symptoms other than pharmacological interventions. Absolutely, yeah. In my personal experience, only the discussing with my patients about symptoms is already rewarding for both the patient and myself. Uh, and usually patients are happy that at least their symptoms are surfaced. And that the dialysis team is at least aware of where the real suffering is. And some part of this can be managed by other means than just adding more drugs to them. So, well, but we about, also about, sorry. Okay, go on. Sorry. The other point is that the implementation in other non-Western countries is that well, I want to go back to what you mentioned in in the paper from Finkelstein, where there were three levels in which which can make use of uh, measuring symptoms. One is on the level of the patient and the clinician. One is at the level of health care organizations and the third was healthcare systems and i think for individual patients we might only need level number one so if it's difficult to implement electronically based symptom reporting and capture these in a registry this is nice for research and this is nice for benchmarking but not necessarily for individual individual patient treatment what do you think about that? I, I agree about that. And, and that's, um, you know, effectively what a lot of clinicians already do um, is, is, is actually think about um, the patient's well being and symptoms rather than uh, their sort of biochemistry. But then, as you say, how do you capture that? Um, and uh, you don't want it to become a tick box exercise that somebody has just said, asked about, do they have itching? But you want to know they've actually done something about it. Uh, and, and that's going to be important for audit. Um, and it's also important for, for research, or if you're wanting to develop something new in your unit, how do you show that it's of any benefit? I, I don't think, though that having complex questionnaires that are only answered by 35% of individuals with decreasing use um, on repeated measures is necessarily the correct way forward. Yes, but this might probably to some extent be related to the fact that also sites need to be trained and need to be improved in mo being motivated about paying attention to symptoms instead of these metrics we are so used to, like KT yeah. over three and phosphate control. But we are, we're all living in a world of limited healthcare resources, whether you're in um, Netherlands, US, and UK, or whether you're in Malaysia, Kenya, or, or wherever. Uh, and, and we need to adapt uh, what we're doing. Sorry, I'm being devil's advocate here because yeah, I have. You know, you know, I think we, we, we have to think of all these things. And, and what many of our colleagues will say is, I don't have time to do this. Or, I, you know, we don't have any, like in the study I showed you from Alberta, it's all very well discovering that 30% of patients are depressed and that this may be due to reason A, B or C. But if we don't have the social care support or the mental health support, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Would you think um, a way forward would be that we lower our efforts on these classical targets of treatment? So if you have a patient with a life expectancy of, let's say, one or two years, then we should loosen our attempts to normalize phosphates, to normalize blood pressure, to worry not so much about KTL for fee in a weekly base and allow patients, patients to skip a dialysis schedule to visit their grandson, for instance, 
and pay more attention to symptoms because then we gain some resources on these classical targets and we win on symptom-based nephrology care. You know, I totally agree with you. And, and, and that's how I run my own peritoneal dialysis program. Uh, we, I very freely let people miss exchanges or have days off um, and be very much focused on, on symptom control rather, and we don't even measure clearance or KT over V or, um, and I certainly take no notice of phosphate levels. Uh, and, and as I always say to people when I'm teaching, I've never yet known a patient come into my clinic and ask me what their phosphate level is, um, but they do come in and tell me that they're itching. So uh, we, we, we do need to change. <laughs> We, we, we do need to change the, um, the way we do things. Okay, I think we've covered most things. I think so. So I think we can wrap up now. Yeah. Thanks to everybody for listening to the presentations and also to our interesting discussion, I think. Yeah. And I think we both hope that this will open even more discussions outside of the setting of these uh, KDECO uh, webinars. Absolutely. And certainly at the Controversies Conference that um, many of will be going to in, um, in January. Okay, thank you, Edwina, for this collaboration. And thanks to KDGO. Yeah. And, and thanks to you, Mark, and again to KDGO for putting on this webinar. On behalf of our audience, I'd like to thank the presenters today. This webinar was supported by an unrestricted educational grant from V4 Pharma and Cara Therapeutics. Thank you very much for attending. At this time, you may now disconnect.